let's get real, religion has become a big business. And especially in the modern American church, it's become a massive enterprise. We can see the fingerprints of business and culture on the church when we look at things like pastors with private jets, light shows, entertainment, huge massive buildings that at times look like shopping malls. But we can see it even more when we dial down and start looking into the systems and how things are ran. And that's the stuff we're talking about in today's episode of the Church Disrupted Podcast. I'm joined today in a conversation from from multiple Emmy Award winning producer Nathan Apfel and executive producer Chris Ayub of The Religion Business, a seven part docuseries that is coming out in fall of 2024 about just that, the religion business. And in this conversation, we look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of the religion business and the business that the institution of church has become. We also look at things like how do we separate the institution of the church from the people of the church or the gathering or the ecclesia. We also look at things like church leadership, church finances, and a ton of stuff in between. This conversation was absolutely phenomenal. And I promise you this, you don't want to miss a moment of it because with every passing minute, this conversation just kept getting better and better and better. I love the time with Nathan and Chris. I think you're going to love the conversation with them as well. So no matter where you are when it comes to the church, you're going to enjoy this conversation. From the person who is still in church every week to the person who is deconstructing and asking a ton of questions, this is going to be a reminder not only of where we are today, but what the true church is supposed to look like as we look back to what Jesus called the church to be. So hey, if you're ready, let's jump in together. Let's listen together to this week's episode of the Church Disrupted Podcast. All right, guys, welcome back to the Church Disrupted Podcast with your host, Jeff Cochran. Um, I'm here today with two guests I could not be more excited about. We're here with Chris Ayu and Nathan Apfel, the leaders, the creators, the people behind Religion Business, the Religion Business, the documentary that's coming out. Many of you have seen it. Many of you have actually told us, hey, we would really love for you to talk to these guys on the podcast. You guys, we're so glad you're joining us today. Y'all are the most requested guest that I've ever had. People always send us messages. Hey, talk to this person. Talk to that person. Tons of our audience knows you and loves you. But there's also a ton of our audience that doesn't know you. I know they're going to love you guys at the end of today. They're going to want to support your work. So um, guys, thanks so much for being on the podcast. But why don't you go ahead? Let's start out and just tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and the work that you guys are doing. Uh, Chris, take it away. All right. Hey, Jeff, thank you so much. And to your, uh, and, and to your community that you've built as well, too. We appreciate all the support and, and, and kind words and encouragement. Uh, it, means, it means the world to us. So just a little bit about me. I'm uh, born and raised here in Dallas, Texas. I went to the Air Force Academy for my undergrad. And I'm a rare, a rare case there where I actually was an active duty Air Force officer, then cross commissioned into the Army. So I had the privilege and honor to uh, serve in Operation Iraqi Freedom. And I had another you know, great opportunity there of being a part of two separate branches and serving our great nation. I'm a father of four, serial entrepreneur, uh, combat sports athlete. And prior to teaming up with Nathan on the religion business, I was the president of a, a large homeowner association management firm, the third largest one in the United States, called Real Manage. And so I was uh, the leader uh, president there for eight years. And uh, as I transitioned from that, I've had the opportunity to team up with Nathan here and super stoked and excited about the work that we're doing with the religion business. Yeah, that's awesome, man. You said combat sports. What kind of combat sports are we talking about? So I do a little bit of, of everything. So I've competed in jujitsu. Uh, that was that was that was uh, that was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. I got I got choked out in front of my kids. <laughs> oh, wow! Wow! Yeah, 
And then uh, I've competed in, uh, you know, your typical stereotype, the uh, karate kid, you know, point style karate and uh, another type of event called continuous sparring, which is about a 90 second uh, land as many shots as you can. Wow. And uh, but, you know, be, being a martial artist, it also means art of war. Uh, yeah. you know, often, often turned with from Sun Tzu's book. And so it's just a lifestyle. It's a way of life. And, uh, the way you think, the way you act, the way your discipline touches everything that you do. Well, very cool. I think you're the first, uh, active combat sports guy that we've had on, but I got a lot of friends who do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and they always say, man, humbling, difficult, It's humbling, um, but it teaches it's you a lot. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right, Nathan, what about you, man? Yeah, I'm Nathan Apfel. Um been making movies and TV shows for about 20 years. Uh, it's it's st- my career started when I was 16. I had a traumatic brain injury, um, and I was 50 50, living or dying. Um, wow. And so I used to love action sports. So I used to be huge into BMX, freestyle BMX, and surfing and snowboarding. And and so when you have TBIs, you can't go back to aggressive. I can't, I can't go into a ring with Chris and get punched in my head too many times. But, um, yeah. and so I picked up a camera and I started, uh, just filming my buddies. And then two years later, I ended up working for, uh, on a couple of Oakley, the sunglass companies, surf films and snowboard films. And, and by the time I was 22, I was editing and directing a TV show and a sports travel show on fuel TV, which was owned by Fox. And we ended that show ended up winning two Emmys. And so that kind of catapulted my career. I had a little bit of flex, so to speak, from a career standpoint. And, and then my 20s, I, I just traveled the world. Um, I had the opportunity to shoot travel TV shows <laughs> literally everywhere around the world. Um, so I've seen, uh, I've been to the, you know, the nicest parts of Japan and Dubai, and I've been to the, yeah. the favelas in Brazil. Um, and as a, being raised in a mega church in Los Angeles, I was always very interested in about uh, around the, this idea of global Christianity. So I would always go to churches and seminaries and um, wherever I traveled just to kind of gain, get that experience. And that's yeah. where I started seeing um, the power of a dollar for good and bad being used in these institutions. And so without even realizing it, if you're a Christian, you'd say, or a person of faith, you'd say God was like leading me down this journey. Or if you're an atheist or agnostic, you could say it's like, it was luck or happenstance that I, I was just absorbing this education while I was filming these TV shows. But so yeah, by the time I was 28, I'd, I'd spent nine months a year on the road for a decade. And so mm. I was exhausted and, and educated from a global perspective. And then I did a lot of work with nonprofits around the world. So again, if you're a Christian, you see it as God using this as a, as a tool to educate. And if you're an atheist, you see it as luck, but I've, I've gotten to work in the most remote mountainous regions in Honduras and central and South America. And, um, I've gotten to see the power of a dollar with NGOs. And when a nonprofit really puts its money where its mouth is, you see real substantial change. And so yeah. I've, uh, my career has been kind of leading to this show without me even knowing it. Yeah. So right now you guys are, are in the middle of this, this documentary is coming out in the fall, I believe. Um, tell yeah. listeners who aren't familiar, tell them about the religion business and how you two kind of hooked up on this project when they can expect it. And then we'll uh, jump in the interview from there. Yeah. Chris, I'll, I'll kind of give the pitch for the show. And then if you want to just talk about how we connected, um, the religion business is a seven part docu series. Um, each show is going to be about 44 minutes. Um, and it looks at the business of religion. And then it looks at the business of Christianity in particular, because as a, a raised in the Christian church, I understand it. It's my wheelhouse. And so I actually demand the most from it. You know, I'm not a Jew. I am not a Muslim. I'm not Buddhist or Hindu. I was raised Christian. So I demand the most from my religion um, that I was raised in. And so hence the focus on Christianity. So it's a show that looks at the nonprofit sector as a whole in the United States. Um, and it's looking at the legal structures and guidelines around the nonprofit system. And then we focus on religion and then we drill down even further onto Christianity. And the reason why we're focused on the, the legal structures is because humans build boxes. We build sandboxes yeah. to play in. We build legal sandboxes. We build emotional sandboxes. We build 
houses to protect our family, we build boxes. So we are dissecting the box, that nonprofit box, and then more as you dial down the, the Christian box. And uh, we are not here to debate theology. We are not here to, to debate your personal beliefs or say, you know, your beliefs are right, mine are wrong. It's we are here to look at that, that legal sandbox and, um, and how, how with reform, because every system has to reform as modernity right. and technology always collide in it, systems are, con these boxes are constantly needing reform. So how reform can actually better the current system. And so that's, that's the show. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And one of the questions before we jump into Chris, one of the questions I'm sure you guys get a lot, so I want to give you a chance to kind of answer it is, you probably get a lot of the questions because um, I know we get these and we're doing something very different even than you guys are doing, but it's the question of, so are you guys against the church? Do you want to destroy the church? You know, <laughs> what, what's your end game here? So uh, yeah, share with us, how would you answer that question and a little bit about what your end game is? What's your biggest hope for the religion business when the docuseries comes out? Chris, take it I away. think, I think it, that ties into why I got in, involved in, in this so the, the two kind of go together so i uh nathan's been working on this for over a decade and uh as he as he mentioned earlier two-time emmy award-winning filmmaker and he has done this is his vision uh this is uh and it, it's a beautiful masterpiece he's creating he has interviewed well over 100 people theologians scholars pastors, uh, former chief counsel of the IRS that specialized in the nonprofit sector. Wow. He's read over 300 books. And this is not something that, you know, he just has just whipped together. This has been a, uh, a masterpiece coming together for a very long time. I got introduced through, through a, a guy that I knew from my prior, prior job in, in, in the industry. And he said, Hey, uh, that Nate's, Nathan's working on this uh, docu series, and I met with Nathan, and I was those light bulb moments we have in our life that stick with us. When I when I learned that eight hundred ninety billion dollars comes in annually through donations to the Christian Church, it's like wow. Yeah. When I learned that six percent of that money gets stolen internally by church staff, fifty three billion, wow. When I learned that only three percent of donors actually follow up on where their donations are going. Wow. When I found out that the religious institutions don't have to do a 990 similar to what like the, the secular nonprofits do. Wow. So all these like wow moments. And then when I learned that 6% actually leaves the institutional walls for the church to make impact outside the church. Wow. And so all those wow moments were what Nathan was talking about, how he has seen these nonprofits out there, the power of the dollar, the impact that they can make. This isn't anything about being against the church. And this is why Nathan and I are very passionate about, we're not here to debate our political beliefs, our religious beliefs. This is about very unpacking 3,500 years of history, the factual data that comes in that shows that there is a problem here. And it's a system that lacks transparency and accountability. And when you look at the impact, the global social issues that we have, and I have to answer this question myself, if I am a nonprofit and my job is to, I want to eradicate world hunger or tuberculosis or malaria, pick your social issue. What happens to my entity if I achieve my objective of solving world hunger, what happens to it? You we dissolve. lose, we dissolve and humans will human. And so yeah. when, if, until we get into this environment, and this is what I'm passionate about, Nathan and I are building a technology application simultaneous to this, where we are providing solutions to what we are uncovering in the docu-series through Nathan's investigations in journalism. It's like, how do we how do we solve for this? And a couple of years ago, Elon Musk got hit up by this UN development economist and said, "Hey, Elon, for six billion dollars, uh, you could solve world hunger." And it's like, 
wow, well, we can't solve world hunger or any of these other social issues with the five trillion that the U.S. has coming in annually in tax mm -hmm. revenue. And we give all this money away to a bunch of other nations. We're not able to solve it with the one point. Four two trillion that comes into the nonprofit space between the religious and secular side. Mm. So why why is that? And Elon brought up a really good point that I completely agree with. Nathan and I are eye to eye on this. Is until there's open source accounting and transparency, yeah, nonprofits will human, and they're not going to be aligned with the fact that they should be in business to dissolve. Yeah, most of them. Because if their job is to solve world hunger, go solve it and then move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But if you solve it, you're worried about the income stream that comes in, the lifestyle that you've built, and all the things that come with the identity you have within that space. And yeah. so my, I feel my calling in this is to make the impact really count and happen and execute that and bring healing to our broken world. Yeah. So, and that's what I love is, you know, watching you guys stuff, you, you talk about some things that are really hard and these are conversations that people don't want to have. Like they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable for us yeah. to have, right? Um, we Absolutely. wish we didn't have to have them, but it's not because you're against the church or anything else. It's because, Hey, look at what we could do when we do this right versus, and, and this is an important dichotomy. It's not just that we don't do good when we don't do it right. We do damage when we do it mm -hmm. wrong. Right. And, and I think right now, you know, to take church disrupted past the podcast, which is just the awareness arm of what we're trying to do. We really want to focus, focus on awareness, research and resources for both individuals to heal from religious trauma and for churches to create safe environments. Well, we can't do that until we go beyond the podcast. So you uh, guys and I were talking just the other day and I was mentioning, hey, we're starting a nonprofit right now to house all of the rest of this and to house church disrupted. But in this nonprofit, one of the first things that you have to declare, Chris, and I love that you talked about it, you have to declare what are you going to do when you dissolve and you can't get 501c3 like tax-free, tax-deductible status without saying when we dissolve, here's our plan. We're going to give everything away to other nonprofits who still have a mission to complete, right? But again, if you get your identity tied to that, you get your finances tied to that. You have, you know, a big staff and a lifestyle and people know you because that thing you do, then instead of dissolving, you're just going to keep finding things to do. And the, the longer we have an institution running, I think the more chances there are that we human, the more chances there are that things go wrong in a nonprofit because they're not supposed mm -hmm. to be forever. Yeah. And Jeff, you bring up a good point when you, we talk about giving, giving the money away to other nonprofits even when we talk about the 6% that leads the institutional walls of the church for impact, without truly knowing and having open source accounting, do we really know where the, where the money's going? I mean, by the time it actually goes to impact the people intended to impact, it ends up probably being like one cent on the dollar. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, we had this conversation as well, because I'm very interested in like the work you guys are doing with, you know, the apps for nonprofits and stuff like that. We're, we're committed because, you know, a lot of like what you guys do, we, we do it from a different vein, but we push on churches a lot financially. Um, there's a lot, and we'll talk about this here in a minute. There's just so much lack of transparency and finances with churches. You don't know where anything's going in a lot of cases. And the churches that make the most money, it seems like are the least transparent from my vantage point, from my experiences mm -hmm. in and outside of the system. Um, so because we push on churches and how they use their money and being transparent. We're committed to from day one, when there is no money, having open books. And anytime donors can ask, you can see the full books. Um, you know, you can see exactly where it's at, exactly what came in. We're also committed to not paying salaries until that's the last resort. The goal is to pay people for work done, um, especially for the first 18 months to only pay for like work done and contract work and stuff like that. But it is hard because there's a gravitational pull toward the way this is taught to be done. Yet we know we have to fight that gravitational pull if we're going to set an example, but we also can't push on churches and say, Hey, be more open with your finances. If we're not going to be open you know, with our finances. So, you know, there's a lot that's scary to that, um, but there's a lot that's scary about these numbers. Y'all said 
so much and you just kind of glossed by it because this is normal world for you, which let's just start with Nathan. You know, you, you talk about you know, being a two time Emmy award winning, you know, producer. Um, I believe I got that right. And you just gloss over that. You guys are so humble. You're not trying to brag about this stuff. That's a big deal. Um, and man, I'm so grateful that someone like you is actually doing a project in this space. Um, but let, let's just talk about some of these numbers. These numbers are wild. And I didn't know most of these numbers. I knew there was a problem, didn't know it was this big until I started watching you guys' stuff. Um, we connected pretty early on online. Let, 890 billion. Let's just mm. talk about that. How did you how did you come up with that number? How did you find that number? And kind of what, you know, when you just started looking at these financial numbers, what really surprised you? you know, most about the stick with the church world more than nonprofits as a whole. Yeah. So people are always asking where our sources come from. Um, and we expose, we're going to list every source of the show. We're going to list them on our website, all the data that's coming from uh, the church perspective. So that 890 billion, that 6% stolen, that 6% going outside the walls, that's all voluntary data given by mm. churches around the world to a specific Stat, uh, group of statisticians. And ironically, those statisticians are all Christians. So it's Christians polling Christian churches. And so all this data is voluntarily given. This is not, um, this is not us going to an, uh, 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 let's call it an atheist liberal think tank that doesn't like religion. So they're trying to paint religion in the worst light. This is Christians yeah. looking at Christians. And so 890 billion is given globally. And one thing that we see that the beautiful thing about this show is we're trying to dilute everything to the, it's the foundations. And yeah. so it is, it, again, it's, I love it because that's biblical. You know, what are you building your house on? The rock or sand? And so we always want to go down to the, the, the base, the, the, what you're building that foundation on. And so we, and we have a couple, we have a philosopher from Oxford, England in the show. And he talks about this. He's a theologian and philosopher. And he goes, when you see your realities, this is what, this is my box. This box that I'm living in on camera right now is my reality. And this is my truth. So if I have been raised in a small Baptist church in Georgia with a hundred people, this is what I think Christianity is. If mm -hmm. Chris has been going to Joel Osteen's church in Houston, his whole life, he thinks 50,000 people and a big performance is Christianity. If you go down to the, a seminary in Brazil in the favelas, they have dirt floors and tin roofs and one guitar. This is Christianity to them. And so when people look at their church, they look at their church, even Joel Osteen's church, and they go, oh, you know, we, we bring in 30 million a year in revenue. That's yeah. a lot of money, but it's not 890 billion. Wherever they got that stat from, they, they're full of it. And then the small Baptist church in the South goes, we live off of a quarter million dollars a year. There's no way mm -hmm. it's 890 billion. And so what, what happens is we've siloed our realities and we all have these siloed realities. And when you hear 890 billion, you go, nah, that's a lie. And so our goal is to, in the opening of the show, the philosopher, he goes, look at, we live in our own realities and we wear our own glasses, but we need to mm -hmm. take these lenses off to see the big global picture. And if we're able to take our bias and bias is not necessarily bad, but like if we're able to take our bias lens reality lenses off and see this big picture at the end of the show, we're going to put our glasses back on. And hopefully those lenses are a little foggy. We got to replace our lenses now because we've learned something. We've learned mm -hmm. the good and bad from the system. And so, yeah, 890 billion um, is generated. Wow. And that's, that's not assets. This is a big point. That is physical individual donors giving money to the church. So that's mm. 890 billion in cash given mm. to the religious organizations, Christian organizations every year. That does not include Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, or Hinduism. That is just Christian uh, giving. And when you start thinking about assets, which I'm sure you guys are talking about in the documentary as well, there are a lot of assets yeah. on top of that. Is that annual? 890 billion annually? 890 billion annually. Correct. You know, and, and so we think about like, you know, growing up in church, someone who spent two decades of my life as a, in the local church pastor, we talk about being the body of Christ. We talk about, you know, all being a part of the same body, even though, you know, we're different denominations, different 
the different expressions were part of the same body. What could we do if we operated as a body? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, that, that shows you what we could do. 890 billion annually coming in. There's no problem the church couldn't solve from a financial standpoint. There's no problem in the world that feels like it's too big for us to solve in those numbers. And if it is, it's a problem I can't get my head around because those numbers are massive. You nailed it. It's a communication problem. It's a, it's a mission problem. You know, mm. we, we, when you have, when, when communication's not streamlined and when missions aren't aligned, you fracture. And that's what the Christian yeah. church is. It's fractured. It, it, go, it goes back to like Nathan, what you were saying about the alignment piece. Do you really want to solve the global issue? Because if you want to solve it, be prepared to dissolve your entity. Be prepared to step away from your identity on that. Be prepared to lose that income stream. And so it's a it's it's a huge misalignment thing. I mean, from a marketing perspective, a lot of nonprofits are able to thrive off of they are making some impact and they they market the photos and market for more donations and the impact that they're making. But when you look underneath that, how much how many cents of that dollar are actually going to the world hunger aspect of it. And that 890 billion is just the church. That's not non-church. That's not secular nonprofits, right? This is just so, the church. Yeah. So 890 billion is the global Christian church and that's, that's individual donor giving. So this is where it gets really wild is if you lump in individual donor giving and I only have the U S stat for this, I don't have the global stat, but if you lump in, individual donor giving to secular nonprofits, that's another 540 billion. Mm. So you're talking about $1.42 trillion in individual wow. donor giving to the Christian church, the global Christian church and the, the, the U S secular nonprofit space. Yeah. And we all have missions, you know, so putting this nonprofit together, we're in the process right now, having our first board meeting, you know, approving bylaws, doing all that fun stuff so that we can send in all the final paperwork that we need. And uh, man, you, you got to have a mission you're trying to complete. Now, churches are a little different because your mission is to be the church, right? But right. when you start a nonprofit, like I know right now we're sitting here looking at, hey, this is going to cost money. People are going to have to be paid out of this to do this work. But there's a reason why we're spending this money. There's an objective what do you think mm -hmm. happens that causes both churches and secular nonprofits to lose sight of the objective? Because nobody starts a nonprofit because, well, not nobody. Most people don't start nonprofits because they want to make money, right? They right. start it because there's a passion to change the world in some way. I would disagree. somehow. Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> you're the you're the expert because you've seen a lot more of this than I have. I'm thinking about me, man. <laughs> Sorry. So. I'm going to paint a story here or paint, we're going to paint a picture. So in 1913, Congress passes income tax laws because the rich are getting richer, poor are getting poorer. Everybody's paying a standard tax. So uh, a billionaire of that time would be paying the same tax as the, the dude living on, on, you know, minimum wage. Um, income tax comes around. Congress has to define the nonprofit space because they see these entities out there. They are doing good work. Like, like mm -hmm. you said, they, these are missional focused communal, like community driven nonprofits trying to help homeless, help needy work in these communities in 1913. So Congress says, Hey, we got, we, we, we want to carve out a, par a portion of the law to protect these entities. There's 12,000 of them in 1913. Mm. And this includes religious nonprofits. There's 12,000 of these great, these small um, businesses that whose their sole mission is to create social change and social impact to, to what development economists call human flourishing to better human flourishing. So those laws, boom, that's where the nonprofit space is defined. That's where they do not have to pay taxes flash forward to the 1970s and the tax reform comes in. Why? Because modernity and technology are pressing on these institutions. And yeah, the nonprofit space is becoming a little abused and everything just needs to reform. Mm -hmm. Like as technology advances and as society's always advanced, you need to reform things. So yeah. it's reformed in 1913. I'm sorry, 1970. Today we're in 2024. There's 1.8 million nonprofits. Now, 10% mm. of the U.S. population is employed by said nonprofits. 5.6% of the U.S. GDP goes to nonprofits. That's individual mm donors, donations. So 
the nonprofit space has exploded. And so if you, and, and there's an argument that says, okay, well, what is, you know, population growth, population growth's happened. Population growth from 1913 to today is 4.3 X. So if you would have just tracked it normally linearly, there'd be 46 ish thousand nonprofits. Yeah. There's 1.8 million in the U S alone. Why? And is that today or in the seventies? That's today. That's today. Wow. So why is there 1.8 million? It's not because all these people want to no, no offense, make change and help the world. It's because mm -hmm. it's a tax haven. Now, granted, yeah. there are really good players in the space, mm -hmm. but the space is the perfect incubator for literally straight, um, um, embezzlement, fraud, and yearment. It's a, it's a way to launder money is, is yeah. what we've, and, and that's of course the worst side of the players, but everybody in the space is not here to help people. Yeah. But it's gotta be a reality with those numbers. There's a yeah. reason why it grew and, and I had no clue they had grown like that. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about one of the numbers you guys gave that keeps me up at night. Like this bothers hey, me. Jeff. Yeah. Jeff, real quick. I was going to add in there, like, about the people that do come in to want to like change, change the world and make an impact, whether it's uh, on the secular side or in the religious institution side, there's a theory out there. It's called the religious economic theory, but just to make it plain and plain and simple, hmm. nonprofits, churches and such, they have to compete. They end up having to compete in society. How else are they going to get donations? How else are they going to get people into the, the seats and pews? And so it ends up being, well, the church down the street has a really good band. We need a really good band. They have really good lights. They have very comfortable seats. And it just keeps going and going and going. We need to plant another church. Yeah. We need to have coffee and donuts in the morning. We need to have child care. We need to, we need to, we need to. And all of a sudden, your impact becomes less and less and less because you are paying for all these expenditures. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what ends up happening. It's this fight to compete and they become part of the system and humans human. And here we are. Yeah, no, that's good. So let me, let me change the number we're going to talk about because there is one that I want to talk about that literally haunts me every time I hear it. Um, I hear it in my, my dreams sometimes now, and I really don't like that, <laughs> that you guys have put this in my heart this way. <laughs> Um, but let's talk about a different one with that. You got $890 billion coming into the Christian church annually, cash donations. Again, we could solve any problem with that. Um, but how much did you say again was actually leaving churches to go back into the world, into our communities to actually transform the world? 6%. So roughly 54 6%. billion. But there's a big caveat to that. And this okay. is where... This is where this show could have turned me into a cynic really quickly. Mm. And the show breaks this down in depth uh, because it's, it's justified. So you have to, again, go back to le the legal terms and definitions with, the, with Congress and with the IRS. They cannot legally define a church because of separation of church and state. They, so they have these terms, which are kind of more passed down via precedent than law. Um, but they're called associations or conventions of churches. And very few mm. people know what this is. So since really 98, we've been seeing, and, and most people will, will know what I'm talking about, but they can't qu quite describe it. So it's a church um, absorbing a nonprofit or a mm. nonprofit becoming a church. So a church can, can, absorb a nonprofit or start a nonprofit. And so, mm. it, and it could be done with good intentions. And I was going to say this earlier. Um, one of my mantras is good intentions pave the way to hell. Mm. And the reason why I say that is if you're not thinking about the impacts and the consequences of your good intentions, it can have disastrous effects. And so these churches, especially non-denominational churches, they'll, they'll acquire or start like, let's say, um, an orphanage in Argentina or uh, um, a homeless outreach program here in Utah. And they, the easiest way to start a business is to acquire an already operational budget business. So they'll yeah. take this nonprofit that has to file a 990 with the IRS and they'll bring them under the church umbrella. And it's called an association or convention. 
And then they turn around to the IRS and they say, hey, this is now a part of our church. And so that nonprofit no longer has to file a 990 with the IRS. Hmm. So even though that nonprofit is doing good in the community, they lose their accountability structures. And so what we're seeing is a lot of these bigger non-denominational churches, what they're doing is they're saying, oh, we gave a million dollars to our, you know, XYZ homeless outreach program. It's staying in your bank accounts. You're just transferring it. The homeless program. You own the homeless. So it's like, you're not, you're not giving that money away. So that's 6%. A, a bulk of that just stays within the institutional walls, even though they can say on paper that they've given that away. So one thing that Chris, and th- this is where it's the perfect partnership between Chris and I, cause I'm just a creative kind of gunslinging cowboy, so to speak. Um, Chris is a, a strategic, like he, he's a planner and strategist. And so mm-hmm. he understands how to roll things out and how to accomplish goals and I'm sitting over here with my view, 890 billion, you know, 53 billion stolen. And so it's the perfect collaboration because he knows implementation strategies. And so as I uncover these problems, we talk about, okay, how can we solve these problems at the same time? Mm. Or how can we bring accountability back into those systems? And so that 6% that we're saying leaves the institutional walls, a lot of it is just recaptured by the same institutions, just under different names. Yeah, it's going to nonprofits and organizations they own. Um, so for listeners, that aren't but they're not even with- nonprofits now. They're they're fl- so this is a big deal. They're yeah. they're being registered as churches. Mm. So for listeners who aren't familiar, who aren't in this space, explain to them what a nine ninety form is because that is the biggest. I think the biggest form of public accountability that we have from nonprofits. But churches don't have to play by the same rule as secular nonprofits. So let's talk about that nine ninety form and why it's a big deal that when these organizations get absorbed they no longer have to fill out the 990s. Mm-hmm. So a 990 is, so So if you're an employee, you file a W-9. If you're a contractor, you file a 1099 with the IRS. If you're a nonprofit, you file a 990. And that's an informational document. This isn't a, this isn't a tax return because you're not getting, mm-hmm. you're not paying tax and getting tax refunds. The 990 is strictly an informational document, a legally binding document that shows your, your revenues in and your revenues out. And the whole goal of that is just to bring accountability into that nonprofit structure. So it shows highest salary earners. It shows um, uh, physical building assets owned. It shows, which is a big one in the show, it shows private planes and ownership of private planes. Mm. It shows where the money's allocated. And now granted, the 990 is not a perfect form. We are exposing nonprofits that generate over a billion dollars a year, and you really don't know where anything goes. But at least it at least it reconciles the billion, if that makes sense. You see, mm-hmm. you see the billion churches, and you see which, some of the salaries of like the biggest players there too. You see the sal- right. you see the salaries, you see um, expenses. So you you get kind of a snapshot of where at least the money's going. Um, mm-hmm. It's not line itemized. There's no expense list. Like if you're Chris can talk to this brilliantly in the in the for profit world and in, in in the publicly traded co- world those dollars are line itemized to the cent. You know, Mm -hmm. like as a for-profit business, I run a production company. I have to line itemize every meal, every coffee, every flight, every hotel, you know, and whereas nonprofits, they don't have to do it. And the churches don't have to do any of it. And so what, and, and to your viewers, what I would a lot, we're saying, I, I say 49 out of 50 people, Christians that we talk with, have no idea that there's no legal document that churches file. They always, they always just assume that there's a legal document that the church is held accountable to because they see that pie chart that they get every year or something and go, oh mm-hmm. yeah, this is, this is tied to something else, but it's not. So there's no yeah. legal document that a church is, is, has to file with any, with any entity, whether that be the state or the, the federal government. And a lot of times that annual report, that pie chart that they're putting on their website or they're given to the congregation, like I'll just say being a part of the big evangelical industrial complex, it, it it's giving you four or five slices of the pie and saying, this is where all of these millions you know, mm-hmm. are going yeah. and you don't know what that means. So, Hey, here's all these millions going to operations. Well, but you don't understand how much is going to haze, literally just yeah. haze <laughs> so that the lights get caught the right way. So that we have a little bit better light show than everybody else. Um, we actually said, uh, back in February, 
uh, we did an episode where we were responding to just the Christian response to the He Gets Us ad. And it was really, we didn't care about the ad, but the point was, you know, a lot of Christians were asking, well, hey, our problem with this is that they spent, you know, all of these millions on the Super Bowl ad. And our response was, what if we ask those questions first about our churches? What mm-hmm. if we just put that that lens of accountability on our churches first? And one of the the examples we gave were, you know, multi-site churches that are doing LED walls. These uh, the best in the business LED walls for multiple campuses and how they can spend a million or more on LED walls just for their campuses at one time. Every few years they're having to upgrade them because you got to have the best of the best. And Nathan, Chris, we had people who came to fight us, Christians who came to fight us because they said there's no way that's what it costs. There's no way that millions are being spent on these things. And uh, not only was I looking at the numbers and going, yeah, you can spend a quarter million on one LED wall and do that four times to some of these churches, that's happening. Even if it's not millions, it's still a lot. But I'm sitting there thinking, if y'all just knew how much money was spent on haze at -hmm. these churches, like just the fog that you don't even really think about, right? It Mm -hmm. would blow our minds, but that's not broken down that way. Not anywhere for Mm -hmm. the government, but not anywhere for us because we trust our Christian leaders. We tend to trust pastors. And because of that, we don't ask questions that we would ask anywhere else um, where we donate to. So you're saying 6% is the number we've got on record. 6% is what's going out. So out of $890 billion annually coming in cash donations, um, 54 it's, billion. It's, it's the same amount that's stolen internally by church staff too. Yeah, that, that that's the number that keeps me up at night. So we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. <laughs> Six percent, fifty-four billions. What's actually going out? But Nathan, what you're saying and what I'm hearing is a lot of that's not going out. It's being funneled into these other nonprofits and associations and conventions that the the church has absorbed. And because there's no nine ninety, we we'll never know, you know, where that money is going. So that, but that's counted in the six percent. The money they say they're giving, even internally, is, is counting that six percent. Correct. Um, that boggles my mind. Because most of these churches are also teaching a 10% minimum tithe. How can we teach a 10% minimum tithe when the numbers say, we're not even tithing what you're giving us back into the community. It's going to lights. It's going to haze. It's going to programs. It's going to buildings. It's going to things that if we go back to what scripture said, Jesus said things that will be torn down and won't last. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's just to to Chris's point in, in Ryan Burge, you know, defines it as religious economic theory. You know, it's, let me let me back up um cuz this is the, this is probably the biggest visual that we're trying to paint with the show for our yeah. christian audience so we're not go this show is not just for christians we want atheists agnostics jews muslims buddhists hindus we want everybody to watch this because the same paradigms that christianity plays in here in the us your other religion plays in as well um mm-hmm. but here's the question and you could, I could see people kind of playing in it. I think it's fun to, to see the arguments. What is a church? Yeah. And people go, oh, we, it's a little C church and the big C church. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. What's a church? And, it, and if you're a Christian, you got to go back to, or you should be ready to go back to this close to the source as possible That's to right. understand what church is and who's your source, your savior, Jesus Christ, right? So what did Christ call his church? He called it the his ecclesia, which literally tr- translates to gathering, and so in the body, and so it's the the physical people gathering together. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be there also. That is Christ's church. So, mm-hmm. what are the hazers? What are the lights? What are the sound stages? What are um, the children's care? What's those yummy donut bars? What's that coffee shop? What's the clothing line? What's what's those 50 books in your bookstore that your pastor has written in randomly in the last three years. Like what are and the pallets things? of 10 plus thousand of each of those books that are stored <laughs> somewhere in the church that never sold to get them on the bestsellers list because Correct. that really happens. I've oh, seen those sure. pallets oh, yeah. of books. Oh, that, that that's in the show. But so what are those things, right? Those things yeah. are man-made institutions built on top of the real church. So, okay. Once, if, if we're able to explain that, so here's our here's Christ's church and here's the institution. If we can separate those two, which pastors and church leadership do not want those to be separated, because once you separate them, you you if if you're able to make that that critical jump in conclusion, which that jump has to happen if change is going to take place, 
if that if that tr- if that separation can happen, then the real body is going to go. You know what? That institution, all those things need to be held accountable. Why? Because our savior says we are broken, flawed humans. And if we let those leaders run away with the machine, they are going to fail and they are going Mm -hmm. to collapse. And that is what the church, that's what, that's what's happening in these institutions. So this isn't a, this isn't a, oh my gosh, we didn't expect to see this. This is a, if you start looking at it through kind of a critical like like educational yeah. lens, you go, this is a natural conclusion to a very sloppy system. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and when you look back at what was the church thought of, you know, what was the church in those early days? It wasn't thought of as an institution. It wasn't operating as an institution. It was operating as that gathering, right? So you, yeah. you think about the institution now, why are pastors wanting to protect it? Um, and again, I'm not saying that every pastor wants to protect it or that every pastor is bad. Not saying that at all. I know some incredible pastors, but I'll tell you this. There's a few things that if we push on, pastors are going to come out of the woodworks and pastors are going to say things on social media that are completely unbecoming to a Christian. And they're going to attack. They're going to fight. They're going And that's if we attack their systems that make money and put butts in seats. If we attack tithing, if we talk about it at all, people are going to get up in arms. Because whether we mean to or not, when our livelihoods and people in ministry now, I've I've been there where my livelihood is tied to it. When your livelihood is tied to it, you feel like you have to protect the systems. But what we're protecting are man-made systems that we came up with over, you know, hundreds and thousands of years, 3,500 years on our own, right? We've come up with the church 2,000 years on our own. We come up with these systems these aren't systems that Jesus died for. They're not systems that the Bible taught. We've come up with them, but we protect them because they protect the institution. They attack, they protect our livelihood. And uh, you know, it, it bothers people sometimes because I'll always say, I can tell when I bumped up against using religious language because you know, I'm a religious guy. I can tell when I bumped up against an idol because that's when the most religious people and the church leaders come out of the woodworks, you know, to fight over it. Um, but that, again, that just that blows my mind that we're not even giving away 10% because so many churches will say, oh, we tithe, we give away 10%, which always seemed really low to me for a church because most of the money felt like it should be given away. But what I'm hearing now is a lot of these aren't even really, tith- they're tithing back to themselves and other organizations that they're, that they're running. Uh, but let's talk about that other scary number, that number that keeps me up at night and, and messes with me because, you know, I, I'm not sure who's stealing it. Um Probably there's a, there's a guesses, specific, but... there's a specific profile of individual hmm. and it's not, it's not, it's not the, it's not all the money, but it's a, there's one character type and it's not what you guys expect. But we're talking almost the same percentage, right? 6%, mm-hmm. 53 billion. I think you said 54 billion actually leaves the church. 53 billion out of 890 billion is stolen. You guys call it ecclesial theft, I believe. Talk about that. Like explain what ecclesial theft is and, and yeah, help us understand like where, where is that money going? How do you know it's stolen? Um, and what can we do about it in our churches to keep that from happening? Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention what ecclesiastical theft, theft is and then Chris can take, you know, the, the, the accountability side of it. Ecclesiastical theft is, is just a, a scientific term, term for money that's being stolen within religious organizations. And I might be butchering that a little bit, but it's basically money given via donation or tithe to a religious organization and then individuals or an individual within that organization just straight stealing that money. So it's money that's put into a coffer, literally dropped into a plate or deposited online. And then whatever happens down that value chain of getting that money into the main account, when you try to reconcile it, oh, we generated 500 bucks this Sunday and on Monday, 450 is deposited. What happened to that 50 bucks? That's ecclesiastical theft. There's just a discrepancy in what's counted versus what's deposited. Hmm. So where do, you think, think, where do you think that money's going? Like, where, where, what do you think that profile is of the, the people who are stealing it? Is that, more church, is that more church leaders or is that more laity that's handling this? What do you think? <laughs> so this goes to the importance of the show. It is, women are going to hate this. It's a woman that's been working in accounting for less than three years within the church. Mm. So it's basically, it's, a, it's, it's the, it's, a, it's, it's basically who oversees the books because 
she is, there's no accountability practices and safeguards usually built into these systems. So yeah. we're not saying it's always her. We, we have stories of pastors we, literally just as they're counting, we have stories of volunteers counting cash and the pastor walks in and will just pick up a couple thousand dollars and just How walk they not out. Leave when that happens. I don't understand. Well, because what, what they'll say is they'll watch the pastor go out to the, and these are usually in smaller churches, go out to the front door and when there's a person that either needs money or volunteers, sometimes even he'll just, here's a hundred bucks. You've worked hard this week. You've volunteered hard. Hmm. That's theft. You're, you're, you can't just go in and just grab money from the table and start giving it out to people you want to give it to. Like those donors gave it for a very specific yeah. reason. And so that's the donor profile is a, is a woman that mm. works in accounting for less than three years. Yeah. So Jeff, in adding that at, at the end of the day, if we're not talking about this issue and we're not bringing to light this issue and we're not creating uh, a more open source accounting type of environment, it, then the problem will continue to persist, right? There has been little to no accountability within the system. And so being able to put the light onto these organizations, see the accounting more, that alone will dramatically reduce the ecclesiastical theft just in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if a parishioner is asking questions and they're just saying, hey, I want to know what the safeguards are at my church. I want to know if my church, because again, we have our own glasses like you guys talked about. And I can hear yeah. people right now who are listening and going, oh, I get it's a problem. It's just not a problem at my church. So one of the things we're trying to get people to do is we're really trying to encourage those in our community who are still actively involved in the church to simply start asking questions. Um, and I'll tell you one of the things we talk about very often is asking questions is not a bad thing but you can learn more from how the responses are given and the attitude of the response almost than you can learn from the response. Do people want to give you an answer? Are they sidestepping? Are they getting angry? Um, but uh, in a lot of our religious institutions, because of a culture of honor and a culture of keeping unity and trusting leadership, um, people are made to feel bad if they ask questions. So one of the things we're trying to get them to do is just ask questions. And if you're made to feel bad or you're not getting answers, that should tell you a lot about what's going on. Right. But what are some questions, Chris, that, that the average parishioner could ask to see, is this a problem in my church or is the church that I attend the church that I'm a part of, or, or they may be doing better than the rest of the accountability. Oh yeah. You definitely want to follow the money, right? So you donate money to the church and you attend the church asking questions well, such as how much money is um, for salaries does our pastor receive a housing stipend? Is that disclosed? Is um, how much money leaves the, the institutional walls of the church? And then a follow-up question, are those the money that's going outside, are they related entities in any way, shape, or form to the church? So asking educated questions like that, I mean, how, how, much, how much money is spent on, going back, Nathan said this earlier, and I, I don't mean to like take a little bit, like in the public sector or even in the private sector, you can buy shares of a company and they provide mm -hmm. and disclose a ton of information and you're able to identify how that money is being used and there's certain reports and metrics reporting how much the salaries are and all that kind of stuff, which is a great, a great thing. If you donate to a church, you have every right to know and follow up and only 3% 3, 3 do. And so is your money being invested appropriately? Because... You go, you go and invest in a company, and if you find out that that company, the you know the 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 CEO of that company's making millions of dollars and not having results of impact to its mission, there's questions. The whole private jet thing, the five star meals, the five star hotels, the lights and production that go on in the church, the book yeah. sales. Are we are are we buying the pastor's books? to feed the pastor income over here. So it's, it's, it's being aware of all that stuff and asking those questions because in no other world would you find that acceptable <laughs> if you invested your own money into a company and that type of behavior is going on. And you said it beautifully, Jeff. The body language, the attitude, the sassiness that goes with 
someone's behavior and energy when they ask us questions. If you're being open and transparent and living in the light, if you will, you'd, be, you'd love to answer those questions. You would yeah. love to. You'd welcome it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Well, and this goes back to when you look down the, let's call it the, the value chain, right? It's like we're talking about very high level problems right now. We're talking about account like, you know, private jets, buying nice meals, travel. But, but let's go back to the, the foundation again. You know, and it's because everybody, and this is what I'm realizing and Chris are realizing on our social platforms, no one has the argument. They can't come back with us. They end up calling us socialists, communists, Nazis, you know. Um, um, That's better well, than what I get called. I get called <laughs> Satan all the time. Oh, there that's we go. The we've, had, we've, got that. we've had a couple, but it's like, that's their only thing they can do is sling yeah. mud at this point because we're not, we're not trying to argue their, their reality. So remember that box. We're not trying to argue their reality against my reality. We're trying to argue the bedrock of all our cult, like cumulative realities. And the bedrock is those 1913 guide, like tax laws and guidelines Mm -hmm. and how those have created the consequences that we're living in right now, the good and bad. And so it's like, you can't argue that. Like we're just arguing fact and data and we're saying, Hey, that fact, those, 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 those legal structures are archaic. Um, we have electric cars that are self-driving now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you're basically saying the nonprofit sector is a Ferrari and the IRS and these guidelines are a golf cart and you say go at the same time. And the golf cart's got to catch the Ferrari. And he's like, that's a great analogy. He's like the IRS, there's those laws are so archaic that the Ferrari will yeah. be gone. You won't even be able to see it in six seconds. And that's that's the system we, that's the that's the religious, that's the nonprofit system, which includes religious nonprofits right now. Well, and, and religious nonprofits just get by with more. You know, it's, it's not just religious nonprofits or not religious nonprofits, but you, the church. Churches don't have to fill out the 990. But also, you know, um, Last year, the NLRB ruled that open language, broad language, non-disparagement, non-disclosure agreements were illegal to be used in the workplace. Yet, because the separation of church and state, they won't prosecute churches for doing the same thing. So churches have less accountability on like the 990s and are allowed to do things that the secular world has said is immoral simply because of that separation of church and state versus when we go back to what you said, Nathan, we go back to the foundation. What's the requirement? for church leaders here. The number one requirement for any sort of church leader is to be the phrase is above reproach, which goes back to Chris, what you were talking about. If I'm above reproach, I don't care if you ask questions. So I can tell you where I was. I can tell you what I was doing. I can tell you how excited I am about where that money was going. You know, um, there's rules and systems that can keep you above reproach. But what I'm seeing is Mm -hmm. I'm seeing churches not doing things they could do voluntarily or do more. Let's do more than a 990 form. Let's give out detailed records of how our finances are being spent. Um, Let's just be open about that. But also um, NDAs that are illegal in the business world right now are standard practice in the church world. And for a lot of people, they don't realize that's part of where this, this money is going. A large part of that 890 billion, I'd love to know how much it is if you guys know, but a large part of it is tied up in severance and hush money payments that nobody can talk about because they've signed those NDAs. And those NDAs keep people quiet most people have no idea that their tithe money has ever been used for an NDA. When if you've had a pastor or a staff member who has left and they've left kind of quick and the story didn't add up, your tithe money was probably used to pay that person off. Well, look, the Catholic Church is a prime example of that with the billions of dollars paid in settlements with the abuse stuff. Um, you know, going to kind of back, Jeff, we talk talking about being above reproach. Uh, this this environment we live in, you see it with politicians and you, leaders of our country, and you see it with leaders of the church. It's to portray this like I am a perfect moral human being, and I will do everything in the world to cover up, which comes from what you're discussing. Yeah. And I need I need that. Well, how about a little bit of humility? What happens if money is stolen in the church? What about sharing that with your congregation? What about having some humility when you make a mistake and owning it as a church, as a leader in an organization? That's yeah. hard to do. It's very hard to do. 
But I think that level of humility as a broken shepherd, not the good shepherd, but a broken shepherd, is what we really truly need as a nation to heal. Again, it's our realities. My theology is the right theology. Mm -hmm. And so it's instead of saying, hey, I don't know. I'm broken. I'm flawed. Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. be more Christ-like because Christ, whether you're a Christian or an atheist, Christ is a very interesting character to discuss yeah. from a human perspective, from a human image, like from a character perspective. Um, instead, to Chris's point, yeah. it's ego, pride, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you hear pastors just bashing each other on stage. There's a pastor in Texas who almost every sermon I'm ever at, he goes, I could drain every church in this whole city, but I won't do that. And it's like, dude, shut up. <laughs> like, like you, you arrogant prick, for lack of a better term. Like, you should be like, how can we better our, <laughs> our, my flock here? But instead, I'm going to drain every every church in this city. It's almost uh, like, yeah. hey, look at how good of a person I am because I'm not doing that thing. When, you know, it, it's just a reminder because we, we get so much pushback on social media. And like I said, mm -hmm. you know, get called Satan and everything else. The worst pushback is when we push on the systems from pastors mm -hmm. And uh, man, sometimes you'll just get crickets when you start asking them, hey, where's the fruit of the spirit in this? Because it's just not, it, it's not there. But I'll tell you the number one way that we get rid of pastors who won't let go. Like they are just, they're attacking us. They're not even arguing anymore. I don't know if you guys experienced this. I think you do from some of the things you said <laughs> early, but we, we get to a point where they're not even arguing the topic mm -hmm. of a video anymore. They're just calling us names and arguing how broken yeah. we are, right? Yeah. Um, the number one way I've found to get rid of them is to simply say, um, oh, yeah, you know, let mm -hmm. them know I know the name of their church from their bio or ask them the name of the church and they'll go away because they don't want us looking into it. They don't want us yeah. checking into it. We've had a few where I just call back some information I found about their church. They go away because they don't want that level of, uh, of accountability. Right. But we forget sometimes because we live in an era where it feels like successful churches have become at times about more about entertainment and a charismatic speaker, yeah, you know, then yeah. it actually has about the fruit of the spirit or following this Jesus guy who turned the world upside down for whatever you believe about Jesus. He turned the world upside down. Um, I, but I, I want to look at this guys. This, this is, I did some math at one point <laughs> I was looking down and I hoped you guys didn't think how Jeff's not engaged in this conversation. I was doing math. I'm not good at it. So I had to have a calculator out. If we take out the 53 billion that's stolen, and we take out the 54 billion that's given away, right? That leaves us with 783 billion that it, it looks like to me is staying inside mm -hmm. the church building or inside the program, salaries, programs, and general operations. Is that correct? Uh, buildings are super expensive. Like yeah, 40, 43%, or I'm sorry, 44% of that entire 890 billion is strictly salaries. So let wow. that sink in for a second. Almost half. 40, almost half of that 890 billion is salaries. And so we need to, when you go to churches now, especially non-denominational churches, the big ones, they have hundreds of people on staff, hundreds, yep. not including the hundreds of volunteers that we would argue is almost slave labor. Yeah. Well, I've been a Not part of like that system. I've been a part of almost a hundred staff members and thousands of volunteers. You know, you got one staff member for every 250 or so volunteers. It's a lot of yeah. labor. Yeah. So, and I believe, don't quote me on this because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but then operations. So to Chris's point, buildings, overhead, um, air conditioning, electricity, all that is about 24%. Yeah. And then uh, the other chunk, Nate, adding into that is what is spent on fundraising. That's a, that's a pretty mm -hmm. decent chunk too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. So, so, so here's, go ahead. Nate. Oh, sorry. Go, oh, I was gonna say, here's a great, so this pie chart you see from a church and they got like yeah. four little silos usually. And they say, look at ministry is 37%. There's no way mm -hmm. it's 37%. What that is, is it's a slush fund. Cause mm -hmm. you have no, nothing's line itemized. So That's that right. nice steak dinner that the pastor took this other pastor to ministry, that flight to that, you know, convention, those hotels, ministry, the, the, <laughs> this is gonna be a funny one. The constant coffees that the head pastor's always meeting with people over 
mm -hmm. those coffees are ministry. So we, since it goes back to that idea that the IRS can't define things, since you can't not define church legally, you can't define ministry, you can't define mission. So all those little or big chunks of that pie chart that you're seeing, it's mm -hmm. all just slush funds. It's one big slush fund. Yeah. First, if you have a yeah. church that's being transparent, they're going to give you more than a pie chart. They're going to give you a breakdown with a decent bit of line items of the budget. May not be every single yeah. transaction, yeah. but you're going to be able to get a much better idea. Like if I would mm -hmm. say this, if your church isn't giving an annual report that shows you at minimum the total money going to salaries, then it's not detailed enough, right? But then beyond that, there's, and I want to talk about this here in a minute, but I, I don't want to miss something. I want to make sure we talk about income discrepancy because there is a lot of that in the church. So people think, oh, all pastors are making this money. When you realize the income discrepancy, it gets even worse. But Nathan, you, you said, you said something a minute ago, I don't want to miss. You said you got all those volunteers doing this work and we would call that slave labor. I agree, but I want to, want to hear a little bit more about that. What have you seen when it comes to work done by volunteers, volunteer exploitation? Um, what, mm -hmm. you know, the average amount of hours you're seeing people work, like just, just talk about what you guys have seen as far as volunteers go. Yeah, that's probably been our, our biggest, we, we've had thousands of messages across our social chat platforms and, and Chris, you know, handles a lot of that. So a big, a big shot, like, to people who follow our social channels, you're usually hearing from either Chris, myself, or two, two people that handle our social programs. Like we want to hear from you because yeah. what those conversations are is it's giving us real time feedback on things that we're missing and things that we should focus on more. And so that's why we keep on saying, we want to build this community. We want to flush these ideas out because there yeah. you guys are actually helping us figure out like, like there's, there's been huge eye-opening moments where I'm like, oh, I wasn't even thinking that ma that number mattered. And that's mm -hmm. what people are most interested in, you know? Um, but so we've heard from multiple hundreds of people that volunteers, there's no, there's no like time limit on volunteers, mm -hmm. you know, so you can be working these volunteers for 10 or 12 hours a day. Um, yeah. I was just at a church in Washington where they had, they had six red cameras operating all on all using volunteer operators. They had five still camera photographers, uh, mm -hmm. volunteers. They had jib operator volunteers. And I, and I'm a film guy. Like I know what it takes to operate that jib. Yeah. And I sat right next to this operator. He had no, he almost took people's heads off multiple times with this, with this 200 pound crane. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that is an OSHA violation. And like that church could be sued if that thing hit anybody in the back of the head, but they don't care. And you just look at the scope of volunteers and especially volunteer if he's burnout, operating that jib for six services that weekend. For sure. And so, but here's the bigger kicker that I've seen and we've seen across multiple, this goes to the associations and conventions of churches. A lot of churches are starting universities. Mm -hmm. or seminaries. Yep. And that seminary is a church, which it's not. It's a, it should be registered as a nonprofit filing 990s, but it is now an association of a church. So a lot of these churches are forcing their volunteers that if you ever want to get a job with us, you need to go to our university. You need to mm -hmm. pay our tuition. And at the same time, we're going to demand 10% of tithing to the church. And if you don't, There's if a, you go below 10%, you're fired on the spot. Yeah. And so, so these churches are, and people do not like this, but they are the epitome of authoritarianism. They, they demand you tithe, they demand you give hours, and then there's just no accountability up that hierarchical chain. And mm -hmm. so like we, we did a, we did a post yesterday, um, with a brilliant, he's, his name's Peter Clark. Um, it's from a podcast that's dropping tomorrow. He's been working in the nonprofit sector globally for uh, about 40 years. He's a PhD from Harvard. He was like on the front lines of the AIDS crisis in Africa. And, and like, he is, he is an expert at strategy deployment in, in over 150 countries in the U S in the, in the world. And he goes, oh yeah, nonprofits are structured like socialist governments mm. because they take in revenues. And then they say, we know how, how to allocate the revenues better than you just trust us. The amount of hate we've gotten off that post mm. is mind boggling. And, and I responded to a couple of people going like, 
have you spent time in socialist or communist countries? Because this guy's spent 40 years. Yeah. So maybe instead of getting offended, you should say, ooh, th- we should look at the structure yeah. of this. And so volunteers are, are, um, are the, it, it sickens me because Chris, let's talk about that, uh, that Christmas special. Yeah. I, I wanted to bring that up. So you don't have to like, uh, so we're, we're, we're at a place with the environment that we created, the community we created, where a lot of people are divulging a lot of information, but just going to a church, you don't need to look too far. So yeah. here in North Texas, a massive mega church put on this Christmas show, and it was all over the internet. I know all what over. you're talking about. It went viral, right? The angels flying from the sky, right? It looked like yep. the Sermon on the Mount, right? Like the way the production was. I'm kidding, of course not. And uh, <laughs> and so the average ticket price was north of fifty bucks. And hey, hey, let's just talk about that. W- when did churches start charging people? For tickets oh, yeah. to get into events. Come on. 100%. So you got all that revenue coming in. And 90 plus percent, they were all volunteers. Nate, I forgot yeah. the number of volunteers. It was something astronomical. It was well over 100. Yeah. I was, I was, I paid that 50 bucks to go. I, <laughs> I, I was, <laughs> I wanted to, I want, well, actually I didn't. My, I, I think my, my, sister-in-law did or my stepsister mm. i don't know what they're called yeah uh, half sister something like that but uh yeah she she we i was in texas ironically like and at, at that time she, and my dad's like hey we got an extra ticket and i'm like i'm coming mm. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so it's 12 and they were proud the pastor got up on stage after this event and i mean like they had they had santa claus in his sled flying over our heads and it was the most, it was the most incredible. I've been to Broadway. I've been to Cirque du Soleil. That thing, that thing was better than Cirque du Soleil in Vegas from a, from a wow. production standpoint. And then he gets on stage and he goes, we had 1200 volunteers to pull this off. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so you have huge cash revenues. You have literal slave labor, like a base of volunteers mm-hmm. and that, that produce this whole thing. I would love to know if they're paying you bit on that, which is, this is what the show gets into something called unrelated business income tax that mm-hmm. churches have to pay or should be paying if it's unrelated business income tax. That is the definition of you bit. Mm-hmm. I would put money on it that that church did not pay taxes on those ticket sales. Because they don't have to report it. They it's don't have to good. report it. Yep. And so if the, like, They'll call yeah, it a but, service, right, of some sort, or you know. but but so look at I'm in production. They'll say Chris it's related because they shared the gospel at that event. But I'm oh, sorry, sorry, man. I, I'm gonna, I'm just going to say this as a pastor. There is no way Jesus would have been behind making people pay money to come into an event. So yeah. I mean, if, if I, I'm going to I'm going to piss some people off with this, but that's fine. If you go to a church that's doing something like that, if you go to a church that's charging people to come to anything. Um, like that, it, go to a different church. There's something wrong. I, you you guys don't feel comfortable probably saying that, but I feel comfortable saying that. Go to a different church. That's not okay. Well, look at but but as a, as a producer and as someone who produces shows, I see the value in that, and I see the cost it takes to pull off a Cirque du Soleil and the overhead. And why? Because mm-hmm. they have they have the best in the business running those cameras, running yeah. those safety protocols creating this, this, this epic production. Those churches are production companies now yeah. producing events on the level of Hollywood. But I guarantee you, they don't have the safety requirements. Hollywood mm-hmm. does. <laughs> they don't have the professional staff because they're not paying them. Yeah. And so like it is what, what, what our conclusion is, is if you really want to create a profitable, the most profitable business you can start a church. Yeah. Well, like, and, and that's the issue too, church, because churches that are that big, not all churches have big cash reserves. Um, but we, you know, we did a project on, um, you know, miracle offerings and we looked at the miracle offerings the churches do just at the end of the year, your biggest churches that can afford to do these things often have ridiculous cash reserves, millions upon millions in cash reserves. So if you're charging tickets, you're not having to dive into any of that. So that money is mm-hmm. there, but now we're charging people, you know, and, and again, it, it's what you're talking about. They're not being a church in that moment. They're being a production company versus being a church that mm-hmm. hires a production company 
to come in and do that. Right. And if that's the case, I could see like charging for the tickets. Hey, we had to hire a production company to help us make this thing happen that, that we really believe is going to connect with people. Um, man, it just doesn't sit well with me. And maybe it's a personal thing. It doesn't sit well with me, well with me when we are charging people to hear the gospel, um, which I know is at the well, end of the day, the drum to, they're going to bang. You know, we got to separate the two. Yeah. What is Christ church? And then what is this we've created? Yeah. And if we can, if we can separate those, we've done, we've done our job. Yeah. Um, hey, Jeff, earlier, earlier, you were, uh, you were, you were crank, cranking some, uh, some math out there. And mm-hmm. one of, one of the, uh, one of the funniest, like, aha moments is when you think about it. So there are literally over three denominations per McDonald's in the United States. <laughs> Say that again. So there's 13,000 McDonald's in the United States. And we have over 40,000 denominations, Christian denominations across the world now. So like, if you think about it from that perspective, but this goes back to the whole religious economic theory of how like, Hey, how can I be a little bit different? Right. Yeah. I'm right. And it's, it, it, it never ends ever. Yeah. 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 There's a, there's a fun, let's see, should I go down this rabbit yes, hole right now? Yes, do it. Do it. Um, I'm game. So, okay. So, I'm going to say that reformation in the church space is 40 ish, 40, 45 years past due. And so here's why in the night, in the 1970s, a guy named, uh, Jim and Tammy Baker, uh, you know, I think it was PTL ministries, um, got busted first, you know, they wanted to build two hotels and they raised hundreds of millions of dollars. They sold lifetime memberships to these hotels. It was basically like the Disneyland of Christianity. Um, they ended up, pocketing most of the money. Um, they you are driving around Bentleys, their dogs had air conditioned dog houses. Jeez. You know, he went to jail. Um, ironically, he's back on TV now spreading the gospel, mm. praise God. Um, but so Congress back then saw this problem with modernity colliding with religion yeah. and, and they, they saw it, they go, okay, like, like, let's go back to 1913. If, if Jeff, you were a pastor in, in Ohio and you had 75 people in your pews and you were a, a, an abusive pastor. Mm-hmm. How many people could you abuse and take advantage of? 75. That's right. Um, and so you had those 75, five, you're talking to 10,000. And then moved to TV in the 60s. Now you're talking to millions, right? So now your audience is larger. Your abuse mm. or your malicious intent or even your good intentions can now hit a broader audience, right? And so Congress in the seventies was going, Ooh, like this is going to get out of hand. And so I think it was his name was Senator yeah. Hatfield, uh, put a bill was drafted a bill that said, Hey, okay. If you're a church or a nonprofit and you're asking someone for donations on that moment that you ask for the donation, you have to provide your financials. They don't have to look at them if they don't want, but you have to give them your financials so they can see your financial overview. Mm. Well, there was another Senator who went to Billy Graham and he goes, Hey, Billy, we're in trouble here. Yeah. This, this bill might pass. Um, and I can't remember his name. I might be mixing it up. Maybe it was Hatfield that went to Billy Graham. I can't remember, but he goes to Billy Graham and he goes, Hey, this bill might Congress might pass this bill. Um, and so mm-hmm. Billy Graham and about 30 other evangelicals got together evangelical leaders and they spun up what is called the ECFA or the evangelical council for financial ability. And that was a response to Congress saying, Hey, we have a problem that needs to keep them. To, yeah. And so Congress mm-hmm. saw the problem 43 years ago bay. and they tried to address it. But Billy Graham with good intentions, because I, I, I think Billy had good intentions and in what he was doing, mm-hmm. spun up this organization. What's the organization? It's the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. What is it? It's a seal that a lot of churches in the U.S. have on their website. Yeah, we looked at them in the miracle offering stuff because they, man, they don't offer much. They yeah. offer about four lines. It's your total assets, your total liabilities. Yeah. yeah. Well, but so what the ECFA is, is it's the, the definition of a conflict of interest. Because if Jeff and Chris both run churches that use, I'll be the ECFA, that use my seal, I charge Jeff and Chris 500 and something bucks a year to use that seal. So if I'm the regulatory body, the quote unquote regulatory body, but then you guys are paying me to keep my lights on and doors open. What good is it for me to actually crack down on you? And so, so the ECFA 
has been the standard for quote unquote accountability mm -hmm. for the last 40 years, 40 ish years. They have no teeth. They have no way to audit. They have no real spine. And so Christians for 40 years have kind of been like, oh, we regulate this body regulates us. So flash forward yeah. 43 years, here we are today. And now not only can like, let's say a select few pastors. So the Billy Grahams of the world and the Jim Bakers of the world, not only can like a, a small group abuse at scale, now almost every pastor can. They can bring in tithes and donations and then just fund marketing spends on social media saying, hey, you know, here's my video. Here's my more aggressive political spot. Here's why Mark Driscoll is my favorite right now, because like all the crap he puts out, not a, there's no scripture behind any of it. He's, he's giving you advice on how to raise children oh. and how to. One was how not to invite your parents over for Thanksgiving if if they're annoying. He's it, like, also it's so ass backwards. Been a part of major, yeah. massive abuse, right? That's been well documented, and yeah. has his old elders that said this. You know, hey, he's not qualified for ministry. Yet he pops back up, and because his videos resonate with people on social media, you know, because he talks about mm -hmm. woke Christians and woke Jesus and everything else, people mm -hmm. are watching, and now we're we're basically funding this abuser all over again. Yeah. But so we are, so the Congress in the seventies saw the issue. Now we're 43 years past that. And what's happened since then? The internet, social media, like technology's just exploded. Mm -hmm. And so what we've realized in the show is the abuse in the nonprofit sector. And then especially in the re religious nonprofit se sector is on an exponential growth curve. Mm. And so here's a really sad, I haven't even told Chris this. I just got the email uh, two days ago, or maybe I told you, Chris. 53 billion was stolen in 2023. Guess what's the, guess what they're estimating to be stolen in 2024? 70. 86. Wow. Billion. Oh my gosh. They, the, so the growth is literally going, it's just, it has these afterburners now and this system. And so Philip Hackney says, he says this in the show, he goes, the nonprofit sector is primed to buckle. Mm -hmm. because there's so much capital pushing on it and there's so little oversight that the abuse is just skyrocketing. And he goes, no one can get a hold of it anymore. Yeah. It's, it's such a Goliath that it's going to buckle. And he's like, I don't know what's going to happen, which is, <laughs> it's, it's not going to be man, pretty. And it's why, you know, because as someone who's wanting to make a difference in these spaces, you know, starting a nonprofit to really a, a tackle these issues, right? If we don't do something different then we just, we end up being a part of the same problems. So that's what, you know, myself and our board early on are wrestling with what can we do different? How, you know, we're, we're really asking how transparent can we be? Like we're trying to push the boundaries on that because well, think, if we don't, you know, anybody can become a part of the same system. Chris, we're, you know, every, like we play in, we play in these boxes and we play in systems from coming from the, like the public, yeah. you know, publicly traded and profit for profit world. What are your thoughts on like, it, 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 those secular companies, you know, that are quote unquote capitalist companies and greedy are more transparent than anything in the nonprofit space. What, what are your thoughts on bringing some of those, those practices, those accountability practices yeah. into the nonprofit space? I, yeah. So this goes back to, we live in the United States of America, a capitalist economy. It's, it's such the power goes into the, the, the people's hands, right? So, you know, well, if you're buying a product, you should know what you're, what you're buying, right? You are making a decision how you spend your money. If you are going to invest in a business and you're going to buy shares of that business, whether it's private or public, you, it is your decision. And as your decision is made in something like that, you are going to be relying on transparent data that is provided to you to make that educated decision. And it's the same thing. If in the nonprofit space, you are cool with donating your money, investing your money, because it's an investment, mm -hmm. you, it is. You may not look, view it that way, but you should. Because if you viewed it that way, more than 3% would follow up and we'd have better accountability. So this yeah. goes back to the, putting the power in the people's hands. If you're cool with your pastor having a private jet, like that, that is a decision that you make. Mm -hmm. This is like, you have freedom of choice, but you need to know that that is what you are paying for. You need to know where that money is going. 
And this goes back to just being a better steward of financial resources, right? I mean, we live in a country where we're, I, I forget what the number is now. Is it 34 or 37 trillion in debt? We don't know where the money's going. Like, we, we, like we're like we just, and that's why, like, everyone's answered all this is tax the churches, tax the churches. That's what people, like, scream at us all the time. And it's one of the things yeah, we the, hear most. The power needs to go back to the people's hands and transparency. Let's, like, get, like, less hands in the cookie jar for just more financial misrepresentation to happen. Like, that's what we don't need. Well, if we would well, demand, here's, if we want reform, all we have to do, and again, it has happened on a, a broad scale, but all we have to do is say as donors and Christians, if you don't provide detailed financial reports and answer certain questions, you won't giving. give and we won't come. Yeah. If you stop attending and you stop giving, even some of these churches that are massive will buckle and cripple overnight. They will do what they need you to do because they are hungry for that money. Then yeah. they need you to be attending or that money's not coming in. So we have a lot more power than we think we do. That's one of the things I always tell people. If you're worried that your church is is dabbling in some of these systems or you're worried that your church is becoming a little spiritually abusive, even if they don't mean that, make your vote with your money and your attendance, right? Withhold mm -hmm. that if you need to until you're going to get those answers because that's how we hold people accountability. And without the the people, this isn't going to be solved by government. Without the people actually saying, we're going to hold these institutions accountable, reform won't happen and accountability won't come. Yeah. One, one thing that, that is, has been eye opening for me it, when, when we talk to pastors is we, we ask them, you know, we get a lot of pushback that people are saying tax the churches and the pastor's responses, the majority of them say, fine, tax us. Mm. They go on the defense, which I think is so backwards because it's like, if you're a steward of resources, you, saying that should be the last option. You should say, I am better at managing and creating impact in my community than the government will be. But instead of them taking mm -hmm. the proactive approach, most of them take the reactive and say, fine, you want to tax us, tax us. We don't care. And what, is that, what does that mean? It means, not, well, number one, they think they have a consistent revenue stream and they've never been, their revenue stream has never been questioned. Mm -hmm. And so they don't care. They're like, we'll just figure it out. We'll go raise more money. We'll ask for more money. We'll ask for pledges and all this junk that a lot of these big churches are doing now. And then what it also shows is that they've lost their identity. And this goes to Bruce Wydeck, who's a development economist at, at USF. He's in the show. And he goes, Nathan, the act of giving today in the Western world, and people, donors are not going to like this, hmm. is a consumption-driven action. And so he goes, it's called the warm glow effect. When you give, your dopamine spikes, you feel good, you feel like you've done something. That is consumerism. That is the same thing as having a drink of alcohol. If you like alcohol, it's the same thing as getting that soda kick. You are giving yourself a rush. So when we see giving as that, or when that's how we see giving is that warm glow makes me feel good. What does that mean? I don't care where the money goes. Mm -hmm. I've gotten what I needed out of it. And so he goes, Nathan, what, what he goes, his whole purpose, he wrote a great book called Shrewd Samaritan. Mm. And he goes, the whole purpose of giving is to identify with that end user who your money is going to benefit. Yeah. And so when you don't identify with the cause, when you, when you really don't identify with that, that orphan in Argentina, or you don't identify with that vet who's homeless on the street, yeah. or you don't identify with those single mothers, at the end of the day, you don't care. And he goes, we've lost our, our focus from a church perspective on giving because we have to identify. And then when we identify, what do we demand as a giver? We demand that the, the leadership milk every cent out of that dollar they can to create impact. And then the pastor would do the same thing. And so when a pastor says, ah, you know, tax us, it just, it, it shows me instantly that they don't know that they've lost their identity and they think they have this endless revenue supply. Yeah. Because why? Because of quote unquote tithing or, or giving. And so the, the show breaks that paradigm pretty heavily. That's the two most common responses I see when, when, when we talk about tithing or we talk about church systems, church growth systems, right? 
when we talk about those, the two most common responses I get from pastors. And again, this isn't everybody. We got some incredible pastors who have great conversations with us. I, I love it. They're really setting an example, but far and away, the most common responses is, is defensive and deflection, defense yeah. deflection. Mm-hmm. And, and if I gave it a third one, it would be villainizing. Let's just start calling you names mm-hmm. or putting you in a group that now looks like the villain. Um, and I think that I, you know, it's one of those things that I hate it, uh, but I'm trying to get better at not responding to it, not getting baited into it, but simply saying, Hey, your fruit's showing people are watching mm-hmm. your fruit showing. Um, so we, we, I'm hoping that people are seeing this, watching this and saying, Oh, well, there is something here because again, just like when you ask those questions, we talked about that earlier, Chris, you can tell a lot from someone's response. Um, but I, I know we're going a little bit over. I really got two more questions for you guys. One is, is, is probably pretty simple. Um, but I wanted to talk for a minute about hidden income. That's what I would call hidden income. I'm just writing it down as we go. I'm thinking about these places where income is hidden. And uh, if you're doing reporting on like salaries, for instance, Nathan, we talked about that earlier, 43% goes to salaries. I can tell you there's a lot of hidden salary that's not in that 43%. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in the system or you haven't done like deep investigative reporting like you have, so you guys have done the deep, you know, investigation, I've just been in the system then you wouldn't even know to ask these questions. But I'm thinking about things like for pastors, um, if we say we're paying our pastor, you know, $80,000 a year, but he's got a hundred thousand dollar housing allowance or $50,000 housing allowance, that housing allowance doesn't show up as income the same way. It's not going to show up as salary. They're not going to report it to the IRS the same way. They have to report it in a different way. But then also for, for churches, even if this is something we have to ask about, you can have a pastor who's making a salary from the church, making a housing allowance, but he goes and he speaks at eight of his buddy pastors churches throughout the year. And they all come speak at his and they all do this little circuit from their little network of churches. They're just good friends. I invited my friend to come speak. And what they don't tell you is what we're, we're paying my good friend $10,000 every time he comes to speak. And I'm not making those numbers up. We, we paid money Way like that. that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I paid 10. The, the, I, I think the lowest I paid probably was, was 10 for big speakers. We've seen up to 25. We've seen all that. Not They're paying for their meals while they're there. They're paying for everything else. So if you go speak at your eight buddies churches for that kind of lower amount, I think I would say of $10,000. Well, now you just mm-hmm. made $80,000 from their churches, but their churches will never know that that's, where the money went and the churches for those pastors don't know they're getting paid. That. Well, and you don't, yeah. you don't call that income. Yeah. That's not their quote unquote salary. So they'll, they'll mark that as miscellaneous income and they don't have to report it to their congregation. Yeah. yeah. So Min- even if they reported yeah, exactly. that income though, um, a lot yeah. of times that income that would get reported is a third or a fourth of what they're actually making because it's the, it's the good old boys club. And when I come speak, not only do I come speak, well, if I did mm-hmm. a book, cause everybody's doing a book now, well, I'm going to sell my book at your place. And you know what? Well, when you come to speak for us, our church, just out of honor, we're going to go ahead and buy 2000 books from you, whether you sell them or not. And now they're sitting in mm-hmm. the same rooms with our books that haven't sold. Right. So the, wh- wh- what have you guys found with that hidden yeah. income? Yeah. Like what, what, what am I missing and what can people look for? Are there any other hidden incomes that I'm not thinking about? Cause there's so much that's hidden that people just, the, the average person's not going to think about. Yeah. Well, I think, again, we got to go down to the the bedrock for a second here because our biggest pushback is from small denominational pastors. And they say, our church isn't doing that. So I'm going to say something super controversial. Denominations are dying in the U.S. They're going to disappear. I don't think in that's 20 controversial. Years, I think it's factual. People just don't like it. Pe- but, but, but denominational pastors will say it's not. But denominations statistically are just dying and hemorrhaging members. Um non-denominationalism is skyrocketing. So in the denominational world, there is some hierarchical oversight, right? You have um, usually like the SBC or you have these bodies that do create a safety net for abuse. So if you go to a Baptist church and you feel like your pastor's doing something wrong or stealing money, you can go up the hierarchical chain and actually find some form of accountability um, or some structures that you can complain with. Non-denominationalism is the wild west. It is usually based off one lead, one lead pastor and his wife, maybe, or a small group of individuals. And the sky is the limit for scale and revenue income. So as, as denomina- denominationalism is dying, 
That means that hierarchical oversight is dying. Non-denominationalism is climbing. So that means that Wild West landscape is climbing. And so anybody who's pushing back on this argument, again, they're seeing the reality of their, their world. They're not seeing the, the, the national snapshot and the global snapshot. We're looking at it from that global snapshot. So as non-denominationalism, non-denomination, non-denominationalism climbs, mm -hmm. these abusive practices and these practices of inurement climb as well. And so, yeah, there's usually a base salary. You know, it'll be, oh, we make, I only make 30 grand a year or 50 grand or a hundred grand. The ho housing stipends in that, that loophole, which is what we're calling a loophole, started with good intentions. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it, it was needed. Today though, people pass, we know pastors taking $100,000 a month in housing stipends. Oh, wow. And then they're not declaring that as, as income. They're just able to stand on their pulpit and say, oh yeah, we make 80,000 bucks a year. Woe is me. Mm. As their, as their monthly mortgage is 70 plus thousand dollars a month. And that's just on their first home. That doesn't include yeah. their Florida beach home. But and I so, love I throw numbers like, out and people are like, oh, you're just inflating these numbers and, and, and you're making them way bigger than they yeah. are. And I'm going, that's my experience, what I've seen. And then you guys do in deep investigations and you're going, Jeff, your numbers aren't even close. They're bigger than that. You know? yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh that's, my goodness. It, yeah, it's, it's wild. And so it's, again, humans like to look, we like to live in our own realities and then we like to see where we're tied to time. So we think a day, we think by days, months, and maybe years we're looking at things in decades. And so in 20 years, as denominationalism has crashed, the, the, the religious Christian landscape is going to be even more abused and fraudulent. And so that's where there's only two things that could regulate the religious organization, external and internal, right? So if, if from an external perspective, that's the government. So this is, I'm talking to every freaking Christian right now listening. Do you want the government to regulate you? Or do you want to bring accountability practices into the system to regulate yourself? And right now is like, you can say, if you're a Christian, God has given us this window. Or if you're an atheist, you say, you're lucky that you still have this mm -hmm. window. There's like a 24 to 36 month window, in my opinion, where we can still sort of correct this ship. But just you look at that 53 billion to 86 billion stolen in one year in 2025 or mm -hmm. 2026, excuse me, it's going to be, a, it's going to clip a hundred billion. Yeah. And so like the, 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 real, and everybody's and this is my favorite part is Christian pastors and Christians go, Oh, the government's trying to persecute us. Mm. No, the try, the government's trying to keep you guys from walking off a cliff. Yeah. Because it's coming. Like those pigs. Change. What, 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 when, when Christ drove those, the demons into those pigs running off a cliff, you know, it's like, that's the vision. <laughs> I like the visual I just had for some reason. It's like, don't run off the cliff, but we're so prideful and so arrogant in our, Oh, don't persecute us that we are running off this cliff at full speed. And right now is this small window, I think, where it's like, hey, with humility and with this, hopefully this, this journey of education, we can put new lenses on and be like, oh, shoot, we, now is the time for change. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's, I don't know where I was going with that. Sorry, but well, if we don't <laughs> I, change I it now, up. if we don't take this opportunity, it's going to be changed for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and it, 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 it's going to be different. I don't know if it'll, if it'll be better. The only way it's going to be what it can be is if we bring reform, right. You know, yeah. and it, it's, it's, again, I love that, that phrase you said earlier, like any system and any group of humans, like we need reform. We need regular reform mm -hmm. because humans are going to human. Um, so last question for you guys, and I'm going to let you go. You guys have been incredible today and I could ask you questions for ages, but I'm going to be one of the first people to uh, check out the documentary as soon as it comes out. But, um, it, for each of you, as you've embarked on this project, what's the thing that surprised you most? Mm. Chris, do you want to go? Yeah, I, I, yeah I'll go. I'll go ahead and go. I, I was absolutely shocked by the amount of revenue that 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 comes in, right? And then when you think about all these large companies that produce a tremendous amount of revenue, and this enterprise is like far exceeds that. And when you think about the number of churches in the United States, like the number is 400,000 and then there's 16,000 Starbucks in the U S. So you start thinking about the perspective of all that. It's just, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Scale's massive. 
Yeah, I think the thing that I've did you what was the question that you've learned? What surprised you most or kind of shocked you? Oh, there we go. I started out as a total cynic. Like I was I was in my 20s, we shot the whole show 12 years ago. People don't know this, but really? I went out and made this whole show. And in edit, we were looking at it and it just, it, I was kind of pissed off and angry. And it just, I, I felt like I was staring at a blank wall, just screaming at the wall. Mm. And I was like, eh, I don't like it. And, and I just shelved the show and had a baby and, you know, became a, like hopefully a little wiser. Um, but so as I reapproached the concept and I think it was because I became a father, I started looking at the church out of love, like out of, out of the love, same love I had for my baby I started having for these experiences I had in my youth. Yeah. And, um, and so what surprised me is even though the data is so damning to the religious, to the Christians in Christian space, there's so much opportunity for the, the religious Christian or like institution mm. to be the light of the world. They have all the resources and all the manpower and all the talent sitting on that their table to radically transform the world in, in a matter of years. Hmm. And so it's just instead of debating our theologies and splintering over and over into 44,000 different denominations, and instead of racing to see who can have the best lights, it's like if we just slightly shifted and pivoted, the church could be the light of the world. Hmm. And I use the analogy of like, so this if this if this line here, this imaginary line is like Christ and, in kind of his, his, his main commandments. Yeah. Right. And you, and this is what the show, this is our history lesson over the show is like, here's Christ and humanity colliding, you know, 2,100 years ago, basically. And then man, here's Christ's message. And then man kind of always just slightly drifted off mm -hmm. just barely, you know, like here's, here's Paul and then boom, here's Constantine and then boom, here's mm -hmm. the papal succession. And it's, you extrapolate that out, that small little deviation over 2000 years, and we're nowhere even near each other anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do we just, here's Christ still, his message hasn't changed. How do we just kink, kink that angle two or three degrees back towards Christ yeah. a little bit. And, and that little ripple as time goes, will have massive effect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what um, surprised me most is, is just like as a father, I see the best in my daughter and I want to like, build her into this strong, resilient, beautiful woman yeah. that, that wants to better her society. I see the church like that. Now you are strong and beautiful and extremely flawed, mm -hmm. but it's like, so let's just, let's just get back or, or guide you back, you know? And, um, and a really brilliant individual that's in the show. I mean, like really yeah. brilliant. And he's a whistleblower that has shaken industries and he's going to shake it again in the show. Mm. Um, he said, Nathan, I don't know if you've, he's, he's genius, mm -hmm. genius. One of the best investors in the U S and that might give you a little hint on what he does or what he used to do. But he goes, Nathan, the reason why I'm interested in talking with you is because you're not trying to dam off a river. And he goes, a lot of us try to just shut down rivers, but he's like real experts. When they see their, their field, they don't see things as, as stopping and going. They mm -hmm. see these things as rivers. And he goes, you see Christianity as a river and you're not trying to stop it. You're trying to divert it. Yeah. And he goes, you're trying to divert it back to where it needs to be. And he goes, I encourage you to just focus on that flow in that river. You just need to divert it. And so that's, that's what I'm um, surprised at. And so excited to do with Chris is, is we're diverting the river back to where it, you know, we're diverting it, mm. it with simple things, encouraging accountability, education. And so we're diverting. Yeah. I love that man. And I think, you know, I never got to see, the original version of the documentary, but I think it's going to be better because that's what I've sensed from your content on social media. It's what I've yeah. sensed from conversations with you on social media to, you know, the conversations we've had this week, you know, face to face virtually. Um, that's what I sense. I, I sent you wanting the best for the church, you wanting to bring a, a gentle correction. So it can be at its best. And, and I think it's going to be received better because of that. I know for, for me, that's really resonated. I cannot wait to see this when it comes out. Um, can you go ahead and give us information about two things? One, the documentary, when it's going to come out, how people can connect with that. And then also how people can follow along and see your work if they're not doing that already. Chris, take it away. Yeah. So uh, fall 2024, 
please follow us on uh, we're, our two main platforms are Instagram and TikTok, and you can just find us with uh, by typing in the religion business. And we will be releasing more and more info on the show as we get closer with the actual release date and uh, platforms. We're, we're in, uh, having discussions on, on which direction we're going to go with platforms. But all that will be released through our social media pages. And please get in the arena with us. Comment, share the content, have conversations. You can disagree with us all you want. This is about a healthy conversation about a very serious issue within our religious institutions. So please, we welcome it. No offense taken here at all. Let's get in the arena together so we could, as Nathan said, let's shift the flow of the river back to where it needs Mm -hmm. to be. And then you'll, we'll start, um, you know, I don't want to overstep my bounds, Chris, but as, as the coming months progress, like we're going into beta in about 60 days on the software, like we yep. are going to start showcasing actual teasers from the show. Uh, we're going to launch our first one early, early April, which I'm really excited about. And we're going to showcase actual snippets mm-hmm. from the show. We're going to start sh- teasing the technology. Um, we are looking for not the, so when Chris says the arena, you know, it's based off that we use that analogy based off Teddy Roosevelt's speech, the man in the arena. And it's like, Chris and I are flawed, broken individuals. Mm. I I hate to say it, Jeff, but I'm sure you are too. (laughs) Probably worse than you guys. (laughs) And we use the term broken shepherds. It's like, Mm. we are going to, we're broken shepherds. And, um, and we invite everybody into this arena, Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar, TD Jakes, Joyce Meyer, um, you know, Judah Smith, like Lander. even the small pastors, like guys, we want you in the yeah. arena with us. And so we will, and we've said this before and we get a lot of pushback. We will fly to you. We would yeah. love to sit down with you and talk through this stuff and talk through the need for accountability and your accountability practices. And um, yeah, step into the arena with us, be a part of this solution and a part of um kind of bringing education to the congregation, which is what I think is most desperately needed at yeah. this moment. And, and, and part of that, Nate, I want to add on is you mentioned going into beta on the software platform. So if you are a nonprofit, whether you are a religious, part of the religious sector or secular sector, we're uh, going to be working with about 50 to 100 various nonprofits initially for, for beta testing. And, uh, we would please reach out to us through our social media apps, or you can go to religionbusiness.com, reach out to us that way. But please do, like, we'd love to have a discussion about uh, you doing some beta testing with us. You don't need to leave whatever your existing platform is that you're using in terms of, uh, you know, for, for fundraising and such like that. But uh, this is a platform that's going to promote accountability and transparency and put money, put the power back into the hands of the people donating yeah. the money. And so please join us on that. Mm-hmm. I know Jeff, you mentioned you mentioned uh, you mentioned you you yeah, you'd love to take absolutely. a look at it as well too. So well, that's what I was going to say. You know, as a brand new nonprofit that hasn't even asked for the first donation yet, we have zero dollars. We want to be a part of that. Whether we may be too small to help you with the beta, I don't know, but we want to be a part of it when it releases. Because again, guys, every uh, there's no such thing as too 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 small yeah. for it. Because we're more interested not in the size. We're more interested in people who are wanting to be transparent. Mm-hmm. And accountable, and uh, I mean the money's going to flow to that. Yeah. Your your people are going to see how transparent and accountable you are. They're going to want if their soul lines up with your mission's yeah. soul and purpose. And people are going to want to get engaged with yeah. you there. Well, the one thing we and by the way, broken shepherds, we've got a trademark on that. Now. <laughs> That's also bad. Um, yeah. All right. Well, if I accidentally say it, just send me a bill. Tell me <laughs> I need to pay for it. Uh, Because I I love that term, but uh, no, guys, I appreciate it. And for us, you know, I mentioned this to you guys yesterday, but I want to say it for, you know, for others to hear. Um, And I'm saying this for a reason that I want to get to, but, um, you know, we can't ask, you know, as a, as an organization, we can't ask these churches to be more accountable and to be more transparent. If we don't first lead the way and say, here's the best way we know how to do it. We're going to be as transparent as we know we can be. So I say all that just to say, um, I hope today that this conversation, I, I hope that it's encouraged you at some point for the future of the church. I hope that it's chilled you to your bone at some point about where the church is at. And I hope that you've learned something. 
But no matter who you are, whether you're in the church, out of the church, whether you're laity, a church leadership, or you've been you know, so church hurt that you can't step back in the doors, we all have a role to play in this. We can all be a part of the solution. Just like Nathan said, we can jump in the arena together. So yeah. the way I'm going to do that is going to look different than the way you're going to do that. And um, I know even for, you know, for those in our community, I hear from you all that, you know, you guys all the time, there's times when you disagree with us and that's okay. But would you consider what your role in being the solution is? And uh, man, we all, we want to partner together, just like you guys, we're, you're doing very different things than I'm doing. But if we'll all partner together and just do our part, we can make a change that doesn't just change the church, it changes the world. What if this 890 billion started going back into the world. Guys, we could, we could end world hunger this year. It, I mean, th that's an actual thing that could happen. We could end kids dying from preventable diseases yes. this year, right? So these are big things. So um, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm not asking you to give to our nonprofit. I'm not asking you to do anything other than consider what your role is in this. And let's be solutions oriented. Awareness is part of it, but let's try to bring solutions. And uh, my prayer my hope is that we see a better church tomorrow, a more Christ-like church tomorrow um, than we see today. Because I really do believe at it's best that the local church is one of the most transformative agents that we'll ever see. But at its worst, we can be the greatest villain in the story. And I don't know about you guys, I don't want to be the villain. So um, thank you guys for watching today. Chris, Nathan, thank you so much for giving thank us you. your time today, for sharing your insight with us. Um, I'm going to be first in line to watch, you know, the documentary when it comes out. Any way that we can support you or our community can support you, um, let us know. Just know that Church Disrupted, the Spiritual Abuse Institute, Jeff Cochran, we're behind you. Um, so thank you guys. Thank you for listening today. Um, toss this around. Let it bother you. Let it encourage you. Let it do everything in between. And until next time, we wish you grace and peace. We'll see you on the next episode of Church Disrupted. 